What's up, peeps? Like we said today, we're talking all about uh, an awesome 3D printer from MIT. But before we jump into that, I want to mention a technical resource from mm -hmm. our sponsor, Mauser Electronics. Um, if you've listened to this podcast at all, you must know that we're huge Mauser fans. We love that they're one of the world's biggest electronic suppliers. And as a result of that, they've got their fingers on the pulse of cutting edge technology. They've got awesome technical resources for us to help stay up to speed with cutting edge technology. And in this case, we've linked a technical resource talking about 3D nanoscale printing, which honestly sounds pretty dang sweet. So we know what 3D printing is. We know what working with stuff at the nanoscale is, which is like working at geometries that are at or below one nanometer. So we're one talking- One one hundred thousandth, the thickness of your yeah. hair. So, so small. It's one one hundred thousandth, one, one, one thousandth, one hundred, one hundred thousandth, way I, thinner. I, way thinner. <laughs> than, than the human hair. Um, being able to manipulate geometries at that level already, that kind of boggles my mind. I've got a sweet spot in my heart because that's where Verbode and I met doing nanoscale level research together. But taking that and combining it with 3D printing, yep. which allows us to basically additively create geometry, but being able to do this at such a small scale using um, lasers that are only two photons wide. Um, it sounds pretty incredible. So it's the same principle as resin printing, which is what things that like form labs and many stratasys printers use. But they're talking about the the theory of being able to do this at the nano scale, building up things one atom at a time, um, having full control over the structure, and using it to complement other types of nanotechnology, something Correct. like CVD, which is very commonly used to create, um, you know, superconductors and uh, other type of awesome uh, materials like graphene. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, one of the things I liked about the article was that it gives you that primer on what the existing technology looks like. So you have that basis when you're, when you're learning about the new thing to know what's like actually really cool about this versus whatever the state of the art currently is. Like other Mauser resources, very well put, very easy to digest, even if you're not familiar with the field. And I really enjoyed reading it. And it's super relevant to what we're talking about today, which is using vision, using a closed loop system to help push the boundaries of what's possible with 3D printing. And basically what this team from MIT has done, they made a super smart 3D printer that can see what it's doing, which is revolutionary because not many 3D printers to date use a visual tracking or visual monitoring control system. Old 3D printers have had trouble with different types of materials, especially those that don't harden quickly. Um, and specifically they talk about materials that can smear during the printing process. Um, if you've got no feedback loop to understand what the geometry is that you're printing, you don't want to use a material that, you know, tends to be a little bit more volatile or a little bit more dynamic while you're printing. You're going to have to be limited to materials that are really, really rigid, really, really stable. Um, and that's worked pretty well to date. But what this team from MIT is saying, let's use a vision controlled system, rely on innovations like these really, really sweet, super smart uh, inkjet 3D printing system that's mm -hmm. been developed at MIT, combine these to overcome these material constraints. Um, and it allows us to closely monitor, closely adjust the printing, but also make things with cool new materials, make cool new geometries that we've never been able to make before and make them a lot faster than we've ever been able to make anything before. Yeah, so the, the underlying technology they're talking about is nothing crazy, right? Like you have ink inkjet printing, which has been adopted by a lot of like big manufacturers. I think... Um, what is it? Smile Direct Club, the the one that uses HP's inkjet printers mm -hmm. for coming up with the Invisalign style uh, night guards or uh, treatments for orthodontics or whatever. So that's not new. But like you mentioned, they talk about how the type of materials they can use for inkjet printing has typically been limited because certain materials, even though it gives us desirable material properties at the end, don't do well with the printing process because they smear or whatever. So what, the, what these folks have added, it's it's the collaboration between MIT, MIT spinoff, Inkbit, and then ETH Zurich, is a closed feedback loop system, right? Like what if after every iteration of us printing a layer, we check, is it looking right or no? And if it's not looking right, how do we fix it? Like the, the sauce is, is, again, it seems straightforward, but it's that the beauty is in the genius of its simplicity. Because every time they scan, um, I mean, sorry, every time they print, they take a scan, they process it, and all that takes about a second. And then you tell each dropper that's within the inkjet printing. Every, there's like 16,000 yeah, 16, different nozzles. Crazy. 
but that's the level of control they have. So they can be like, uh, nozzle number 13,582, drop 80% of what you're dropping because you're causing smears. And being able to finely tune that printing system allows them to have a lot more flexibility with the type of materials that they want to use. Well, and what I want to mention is like the um, analogy that came into my head is like, because we just decorated gingerbread houses at home <laughs> for, yes. for Nelly's birthday, which was awesome, by the way. Um, no invite for me. That's cool. <laughs> if you're like, if you're, we're just going to gloss over that. Um, <laughs> if, if you're, decorating a gingerbread house or decorating a cookie right yeah. trying to use some frosting let's say um and i give you very very specific instructions i want you to make a smiley face on the top of this cookie or on the top of this gingerbread house and then i put a blindfold on you and hand you a bag of frosting and say go do it um you're not going to do it very well and that's basically what we've experienced with 3d printers to date is we give a very very specific set of controls very very specific set of instructions we upload it to a 3d printer it knows what it's supposed to be doing but it doesn't have any feedback on how it's actually going doesn't have right. a visual feedback system to close the loop and understand what's going on so um if, if i if you imagine you know if i was relying on you to be able to make this cookie with a smiley face on it the, the perfect way every single time i'm going to severely limit the different types of materials you can use i'm going to severely limit the different types of shapes that you can use um, to make sure that i get a reliable product that's basically what we've been doing with 3d printing because there's no visual feedback loop to, to help the printer understand and correct, course correct along the way, we've had to severely limit what types of materials 3D printers can use. We've had to limit what types of geometries they can use. Or the most frustrating part, and you and I both experienced this personally, is you may ask your 3D printer to print something that's, you know, toward the boundary condition, at the edge of what's possible. It could run for 24, 36, 48 hours, and then it fails an hour 47. It didn't know. It keeps printing. Yeah. You show up the next morning to work, or you wake up after your 3D print overnight, and it just looks like a disaster Spaghetti happened. Spaghetti monster, yeah. And, and then the 3D printer didn't know, because there was no visual control system to help close the loop. So this, fundamentally speaking, is really, really compelling to me, because we've got visual control systems in a bunch of different parts of manufacturing. It, it seems about right that this has made its way to manu or to 3D printing, but um, for it to combine forces with something like this really, really complex uh, 3D printing from Inkbit, um, that, that's the one with the yep. inkjet printer, right? Um, with 16,000 different nozzles, that's like, you know, two super two superpowers collide here, which is using a vision controlled system to close the loop and doing it on a really, really sweet, really, really awesome 3D printer with a lot of firepower Absolutely. to help push the boundaries and tell us these are the awesome materials that we can use now. These are the cool geometries we can use now. And they're doing things like uh, printing soft, functional, accurate geometries of robot hands and heart models and all of this without human intervention, doing it very reliably and doing it using the visual control system. I think it's pretty sweet. I agree with you, man. And one thing I was going to say is um, it really reminds me of Machina um, for our listeners that might not remember. Machina is the startup based out of California that's using robots to do sheet metal forming. And one thing that was really interesting is that um, these robots are AI powers to know how hard to press, um, to how, how long to deform a certain area before backing off, things like that. A big portion of their secret sauce was the ability to scan and understand the form um, to inform it in terms of how well it matches with the CAD file, which is exactly what this solution is doing. But then it kept iterating and getting better and better over time because it would realize even before it made the mistake how to do it better the first time yeah, around. Not, not just course correcting mid printing, but then also understanding some of the fundamental rules exactly. and principles and incorporating that into the design for the next time. So it's, it's interesting seeing that theme just in, on the um, what what is it, the next generation of manufacturing is that this closed feedback loop system is becoming more and more critical. But another thing I was going to say is now that they've kind of cracked this um, printing of materials that are typically sought after but not possible, the so what that we're, we're going to start getting into is that they can experiment with certain soft materials that they didn't have access to before and do multi-material printing where you can have rigid bodies with soft components like a robotic hand that has tendons that you would want to make out of the soft material but then the skeleton is made out of the hard material on top of that you're not sacrificing your precision either if anything you're making it better because you're constantly layer after layer comparing it with your cad file allowing you to have what they refer to as airtight like 
um, interfaces between the hard components and soft components. And on top of all that, right, which is is obviously a plus here yeah. for anyone that's dealt with 3D printing, it takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and a part of that is, again, if you're trying to make sure that the part turns out to the design that you want a vast majority of the time, let's say 99.9% of the time that the that the desired geometry is produced reliably on that system, you're going to do things like control the speed. You're going to make it really, really slow so that it can move really precisely. Um, instead, when you've got this vision controlled system, you can start to understand where we can basically turn up the speed dial and then not still sacrifice the quality of the part because we're monitoring it visually during mm-hmm. the printing process. Um, this team from Inkbit said that they were able to produce the same parts with the visual control system about 660 times faster than other state-of-the-art 3D inkjet printers. So this is not only revolutionizing the materials we can use, it's not only revolutionizing the geometry we can use, it's also revolutionizing the production speed for 3D printing. All three of those have been um, touted as like potential pain points with 3d printing for, for different applications. So, um, I think that's really interesting. And then it really goes back to the analogy I came up with in my head to try and understand what's going on here. Um, again, let's go back to our analogy. You're sitting in the kitchen for a boat and I'm asking you to make, you know, ginger, uh, decorate gingerbread cookies. Um, if I tell you to make a specific design and you can take your blindfold off now and you've got a picture of what the design is supposed to look like. And you're watching your gingerbread, you know, watching yourself make your gingerbread cookie, um, right next to it. You're going to do a really good job. You're going to work a lot faster than when you're blindfolded. The result's going to be better. You might be able to use more experimental materials, et cetera, to achieve the desired design. Um, in the same way, we're, we're kind of giving 3D printers their own eyes and their own brain to understand what, how the progress is of producing that design. And then, you know, in the end state, what it's supposed to look like and make any course corrections on the way to get there. Absolutely. Well, besides knowing that you don't have faith in my gingerbread making abilities, um, I, I would say that that is a great analogy. Thanks, man. Yeah. But um, I think it's time to wrap up the episode. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I'll give us a quick wrap up here, man. Please do. All right. So think about 3D printing right now, right? It's like it's like trying to decorate cookies without eyes and without a brain, right? You get a really, really specific set of instructions to your 3D printer, but it's got no feedback loop system to understand, you know, is the design that it's making close to the design that you want? And are there any course corrections that need to be made along the way? Right now, 3D printers don't have that ability. So this team of scientists from MIT, um, a startup called Inkbit, and then also ETH Zurich are working together to add a vision controlled system to help 3D printers see what it's doing And then that'll allow it to use many new materials to make many new complex things like robot hands and heart models. And not only that, it'll be able to do it with these better materials over 600 times faster than current printers do. Money. Money. Thanks, my dog. I mean, you don't invite me, but you know, that's the ending was money. We'll resolve that off air. Uh, Okay. All right. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.